No problem. Well, it's very nice to be back in Dublin and myself and Paul uh, are over for the CDT um, board tomorrow. So uh, being a self-publicist, I, I basically said, well, I'll give a talk if you want. I'm coming the day before. So here I am. So thank you for coming. Um, I want to, uh, this talk, I'm going to sort of concentrate on um, the work we do trying to look at very beam sensitive materials, things like molecular crystals. And, but also I'm going to concentrate on um, some of the effects you see in multi-phase systems. So where you've got a liquid and a solid in say a liquid cell in, in the TEM. And, and they can be very, very beam sensitive as well. So I'm going to finish looking at things crystallizing in solution or things transforming in solution. So I'll show some results from that and I'll give you a bit of a, a warning about preparing samples, these difficult samples. Um, so I'm going to tell you something about uh, damage in beam sensitive materials and then talk about how we can monitor that damage. Uh, and, and how we can need to relate that to the number of electrons per unit area, the fluence, and also the flux, the, the number of electrons, the fluence per, per unit time. And then I'll show how we can measure critical fluences before the thing falls apart. And there's different definitions for that. And then I'll go on to talk about how that limits the resolution we can achieve in imaging or spectroscopy. And then uh, I'll get on to talking about how we can avoid damage. And then I'll finish looking at crystallization processes. And I'll finish on a, a cautionary tale about how you prepare your sample and how you can prepare it five different ways and you get five different results. Okay, so most... Uh, in most beam, so what we call beam sensitive materials, they damage by a mechanism known as radiolysis, which is really ionization. And, and it's, it's very low energy electrons that are being excited, typically a few EV, uh, and they can, can essentially ionize and break bonds. Um, and, and that's true for most really beam sensitive specimens. And if we want to analyze something in its, its pristine native state, we've got to determine the safe limits for either the electron fluence, the electrons per unit area, or the fluence rate, the flux. So here's an example. We did some work um, on calcium carbonate. I'll come back to calcium carbonate a bit later. But this was in relation to it being used, they stick it into oil additives to soak up the acidic conditions in, that are created in the engine, basically. Now, um, if you use enough electrons and hit calcium carbonate uh, with, with enough electrons, it will transform uh, to calcium oxide and it will evolve carbon dioxide, basically. So how can we monitor that damage process? So we could do it by imaging, for example, and if you look, um, uh, if you look here, so here's the calcium carbonate nanoparticles, about 50 nanometers. Um, leave the beam on them long enough and they start to develop, I'm not sure if you can see, little pores in the material. And that's from the gas evolution. Um, so that's one way, but it's not really that quantitative. When, when do you say it's started? When do you say it's finished? We can use diffraction, which is probably a much more accurate method because essentially we have spots initially due to calcium carbonate, calcite. And then as you damage it, you start to get these rings of polycrystalline calcium oxide forming. We can, over on, the, over on this side, here we're using energy dispersive X-ray analysis to look at the chemical composition and look at the oxygen to calcium ratio. And this is a function of fluence here now in electrons per square nanometer. So we're up at 10 to the seven electrons per square nanometer. And you start off, as you'd expect, in, in calcium carbonate, 
with an oxygen to calcium ratio of three. And over time, it decays as you evolve the CO2 and you, you end up something close to one where it's calcium oxide, calcium to oxygen ratio of one. And I've plotted here, essentially, this first line is when you see pores in the image. This line, when you start to see rings due to calcium oxide in the diffraction pattern. And this is where the oxygen to calcium ratio drops to one over E. So we, we assume it's a sort of exponential decay, and you often define the critical fluence as where it drops to one over E, which is about just under 40%, 37%. So you can see we've got different fluences uh, for, di for different ways of monitoring damage. I mean, in principle, we could use eels as well. Over here, we've got a graph of, let's change the conditions. So now this is the original uh, curve at 300 kV, accelerating voltage. We drop the accelerating voltage to 80 kV and the damage occurs much quicker. And that's because the ionization cross-section um, for the damage process uh, is bigger at lower kV. It goes as one over the accelerating voltage. So it drops much faster. So it depends, the critical fluence depends on the conditions as well. Okay, so that's measuring the fluence at which damage processes occur. And you can measure it in different ways. The other question might be, does it depend on the flux? So the dose rate, in other words. Dose is actually the energy delivered to the specimen, not... Um, uh, which is slightly different to the number of electrons per square nanometer. So this is, this is um, uh, different fluxes now in electrons per square nanometer per second. And this is the accumulated fluence, that the total number of electrons per unit area. And we've plotted two things out here. One is essentially when we see pores in the image, and that's in, in red and in black, it's when we see these rings in the diffraction pattern from calcium oxide. And you can see for different fluxes within error, they're the same. So this process doesn't depend on electron flux. Um, we can give those electrons very rapidly, but it, it's, it's essentially defined at a constant number of electrons per unit area. And that's not true for every process. There are some suggestions for certain types of materials. It might depend on flux. Okay, so how can we actually be a bit more quantitative about damage? So the tradi traditional way that uh, uh, microscopists have used in the past is they use a diffraction pattern. And they look at essentially the crystallinity being destroyed and the diffraction spots disappearing and leaving a sort of amorphous uh, ring, um, a halo indicative of amorphous material. Now, this material here is uh, it's a, like a pharmaceutical molecular crystal. So it's a molecular material that's bonded by hydrogen bonds and van der Waals bonds. So it, it damaged, it's got a very, very low um, critical fluence, similar to that of proteins, basically. So what happens, you, you can see the spots on the outside fade first, and that's from very short range information in real space. And the spots close in uh, stay much longer, but eventually disappear. And that's the longer range information. So the sort of molecular packing um, remains reasonably constant, but the molecules are sort of, bonds are breaking and the, they're essentially moving and the short range order is disappearing. And here I've just listed some typical fluences. So basically organics are up in 10 to the seven, 10 to the six electrons per square angstrom. So that would be strontium titanates and things like that. Zeolites, aluminosilicates are more like 10 to the three and proteins are typically around 10. So there's a massive range of critical fluences. So what we wanna do is essentially try and 
it's these sort of materials, these molecular materials, um, that we're, we're kind of interested in looking at. And what we can do is we can take one of those spots and look at the intensity of it relative to the background and watch it decay. So here's the, the intensity of, sorry, the intensity of a spot here, and it decays. In this case, it decays by something like an inverse power law we've fitted to it. And we say, okay, when that intensity is dropped to one over E, which is about 37% of the original intensity, we define that as the critical fluence. And then we might average over a number of diffraction spots. So what we wanted to do is measure a load of these critical fluences for a load of uh, pharmaceutical compounds and, and look at the range of them and see if we can tell something about what features in the molecule are giving rise to that critical fluence. So what parameters affect the critical fluence in these materials? So Mark Sari, um, who uh, uh, did this work, he analyzed 20 poorly soluble pharmaceutical compounds. Um, they're interested in these things because they want to get them dissolved to, to, to be taken up in the body. And he measured all these critical fluences. And then he used uh, essentially some sort of principal component analysis, so multivariate statistics, to try and relate that to all these molecular properties. So whether it had got an aromatic ring, whether it had got carbon-carbon uh, double bonds, whether it had got hydrogen bonds in there, light atoms, heavy atoms, uh, melting point of the material we initially thought would be a good measure. And it turns out that the ones that give a higher critical fluence is when, is when you've got an aromatic ring or conjugated carbon, so double bonds, and that can spread out charge, basically. The ones that give a, uh, that relate to giving a low critical fluence, so very beam sensitive, are essentially mainly to do with hydrogen bonds in the structure. And we sort of, we understand that in a way is either the hydrogen bond is breaking, because it's a weaker bond, or the hydrogen bond here is um, weakening the neighboring covalent bond and allowing it to be ionized more easily. And using that, those sort of factors, there's components that either give you a high or a low critical fluence. Uh, Mark tried to build a model to predict it based on the molecular structure. And he did that and got a sort of, not perfect, but it's a sort of reasonable linear correlation between the measured critical fluence here and the predicted critical fluence from that model and those, the bits in the molecule, basically, that we think are good and bad. Okay, what experimental parameters affect the critical fluence, at least in these materials, anyway? So here, this was a bit earlier work. This is a, a drug called theophylline, which is a bit, it's a derivative of caffeine, and it forms these nice plate-like crystals that are quite thin and easy to see, uh, see through in the transmission electron microscope. And basically, you know, that damages. So this is after five minutes exposure and a total fluence of 36 electrons per square angstrom. Um, and he measured it under lots of different conditions. So he changed the accelerating voltage. He changed the temperature of the specimen. He used different support films. Um, and basically for 200 kV, sticking those crystals on a continuous carbon film and at room temperature, he got a critical fluence of 27 electrons per square angstrom. But he could improve that to about near a 40 by going up to higher accelerating voltages, cross sections decreased, so um, we can spend longer on the specimen, putting it on graphene, which presumably conducts charge away, um, and also cooled uh, down to 93 Kelvin. 
And these are the range of critical fluencies you measure. So going from, you measure at 80 kV, where there's a lot of radiolysis going on, to around about 10, and then that um, low temperature, sorry, it's covered up here, but um, low temperature um, on graphene, 300 kV, is up more at 40. So you can vary it a bit. Now, what the critical fluence does, it affects the resolution you can achieve. And ultimately, if you wanted to do high resolution imaging of lattice planes and things like that, um, we have this concept of what's called dose limited resolution, which Ray Edgerton uh, first talked about. And basically that depends on uh, the signal to noise ratio you've got. It depends on the contrast you've got in the specimen. Um, it depends on how good your detector is in terms of the detector quantum efficiency. And it depends on how um, efficiently you actually collect those electrons to form your signal, your image or your spectrum or whatever. And the critical fluence is coming in here. And it also comes in because the contrast, as the thing damages, the contrast disappears. It starts off at an initial contrast, but then decays, presumably, they presume it's exponential, um, uh, exponential decay, essentially the fluence you've actually used to make the measurement over the critical fluence. Because beyond that, your contrast is just disappearing. Your diffraction spots go into an amorphous ring or, or whatever. So basically, if we can improve the detector, use a better camera, if we can uh, somehow improve the critical fluence, or we can collect the electrons more efficiently, we might be able to increase the resolution we can achieve. So here's just a quick example. This is theophylline again. On the left-hand side, this is using our Gatan OneView camera. And this is a dose or a fluence of 30 electrons per square angstrom. And you can sort of see it's noisy, but you can see lattice images here, lattice planes. This is from this little region here. And you can tell you've got lattice planes in this from the, the Fourier transform. But now this is going to um, Harwell, the IPSIC facility in Harwell, using a direct electron detector, so a much higher DQE. And now the dose is down at six electrons per square angstrom. So you get better images at lower dose. So that's one good reason for, for going to these direct electron detectors. So how can we mitigate against damage? Well, we can try and control the fluence we put on the specimen and maybe the, the flux as well. And one thing we found, we've got a Titan with a monochromator. Um, it's not aberration corrected, but it's got a monochromator on. And that's a really good way of controlling continuously the flux that goes on the specimen. So you can really, uh, it's, it's not just the uh, settings on the gun lens. You can vary it continuously. If it's radiolytic damage, which it often is, that's the dominant mechanism, use high KV because the damage is decreased. But often that means a lower signal, a lower cross-section for eels or EDX, um, less contrast in the image. So, and so one of the things people are really interested in, is there a sweet spot in terms of KV? And some people have argued for proteins, maybe it's for a certain sample thickness, it might be around 100 kV, potentially. We tend to work at high kVs generally because it gives us more time to do things. One area we're really interested in is scanning as fast as possible. Because, and I'll show this in a minute, if you've got a damage process that is uh, diffusion limited, if you scan very fast, you can often beat the damage process a little bit. And then cooling the sample or preserving it in vitreous ice, amorphous ice, slows down damage processes. 
but it also slows down processes which might recover the damage, heal the damage. Sample thickness, thin samples damage less, but there's less contrast from a thin sample. So maybe there's some sort of optimum sample thickness as well. And then we've had some success, um, not intentionally, but if you've got an amorphous carbon layer on your sample, that can often prevent a lot of damage just by conducting away charge and things like that. Um, and type of support film, graphene seems to be quite useful in a lot of cases. Okay, this thing about scanning, again, this I think came from Ray Edgerton. So basically you might imagine the higher the electron fluence rate, so the flux, the number of electrons per square angstrom per second, the higher you go, you might expect that to be linear with the rate of damage. However, for knock-on processes, which occur in things like metals, conducting specimens, the more damage you have, the faster it damages, basically. It seems to go up. Uh, the damage rate goes up as you increase the fluence. For radiolysis, there's a lot of evidence that basically you create some ionized species and it has to move about. So the, in principle, if you scan fast enough, the damage rate plateaus as you go to very high fluxes. So you can have a very high flux beam and scan it very fast, basically, across the specimen. And that's the sort of theory of that. And I'll show some evidence for that. OK. Using that knowledge, I'm going to go on now. We A few years ago, we got a liquid cell TEM and in some um, uh, a liquid cell TEM holder. And uh, in some ways, I wish we hadn't. <laughs> but it's been quite interesting studying it because the problem with it is you do an experiment, you can never repeat it half the time. But, um, but it is, in principle, quite a, a useful technique once it becomes well established. So we can look at hydrated materials. Um, in principle, we can look at dynamic processes within the liquid. So basically you have, for those of you who haven't seen one, it's basically two little chips um, uh, to get uh, bolted together. And this is, these are silicon and they've had a, a silicon nitride window etched, a thin silicon nitride window etched between them. And then you have little spaces between the chips, which are typically between 250 nanometers and a micron or so. Now, there's two issues with this. One is, what's the electron beam doing to the liquid? Because in the liquid, things can move about very fast. And also, that you've got a tiny picoliter volume in here. It's very confined. But, and we wanted to study crystallization because it's sort of uh, applicable in biomineralization processes, stopping pipes blocking up in the oil and gas industry and in principle batteries and things like that. However, the big issue is um, whenever you hit water, for example, if we're doing an aqueous solution, is we have radiolysis of the water, not only of the sample. And when you, this has been studied in the nuclear industry, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Basically, you get all these species uh, being produced radicals, solvated electrons, um, hydrogen ions, um, peroxide, hydrogen gas. And one of the big things, and these can all affect the chemistry. So, so basically, the, the electrons can induce reduction of things. Uh, the hydrogen ions essentially can change the pH. And these are some theoretical calculations from, um, well, quite a number of years ago now, eight years ago, from Francis Ross's group, uh, looking at the concentration of these species uh, as a function of time at a certain fluence, basically. And they managed to plot out, uh, in relation to the hydrogen ions, what the pH would be for different, this is dose rate now in 
the proper units grays per second, which is a nuclear um, nuclear um, unit, basically. Now, just to so here's basically the initial pH at low uh, dose rate, and then as you go to higher dose rates, basically alkaline things become much more acidic because of these hydrogen ions being created. And just a cautionary tale here, or a warning, one electron per square angstrom is about between one and three or four megagrays per second. So that puts us up here. So that's like three orders of magnitude larger than a nuclear reactor, basically. That's what we're doing to our poor little specimen in the microscope. So basically, Anything in, in this region will just become more acidic and the chemistry changes and you're not looking at the thing you thought you were, basically. So one idea there is to make, if you look at the rate of a process, you do it at different dose rates and then maybe try and extrapolate to low dose. Um, and some people have tried that. But we haven't got a massive range of dose rates achievable because it is a very harsh environment. So liquid cell T, and we can do direct visualization, but we need to start trying to calibrate the change in chemistry. So say pH. So we're beginning to use different particles that dissolve at different pHs or polymers that aggregate or disaggregate at certain pHs to try and work out, okay, for this given system, for, for this setup, if we hit it with these number of electrons per square angstrom, we're going to change the pH by so much. And we're starting to do that. And we're also thinking about using buffers or, or scavengers to grab some of these chemical species. But if you add things in there, you're changing the chemistry anyway. So it might not be the same. It's not the same system you wanted to look at. The other way is actually to correlate this with cryo TEM. So here you rapidly freeze your liquid with whatever's in it, particles or whatever. At a certain time point, you get a snapshot of what was happening at that time point. And this, you can either blot the sample and plunge it into liquid ethane. You can spray uh, onto a cold grid and plunge. And you can even be, now begin to spray sorry spray onto a cold grid and you don't have to plunge at all so you can get down in principle to sort of millisecond time scales now with these techniques so here's just a couple of examples from the liquid cell tem so this just shows scanning faster reduces the damage so basically zinc oxide when it gets to pH 5, we'll start dissolving. And on the uh, left-hand side, we've got a one microsecond dwell time in STEM. So this is a STEM um, dark field image. And on the right-hand side, we've got a 10 microsecond dwell time. So scanning a lot more slowly. And basically, you can see, this is jerky because of the longer dwell time. This is taking... Uh, 170 seconds to dissolve at a total fluence of about 40 electrons per square angstrom. This dissolves much earlier and at a lower fluence. So scanning faster seems to keep the pH change. Um, it's, it's a slower effect. And then this one just shows the effect of trying to uh, mitigate against the pH change by having a uh, a PBS buffer that will take up those hydrogen ions. So here's zinc oxide, um, and we're essentially getting dissolution um, basically after a certain fluence. In the buffer, it takes ages and ages to dissolve. So we can stop it happening, although it's not just water anymore. It's, it's uh, uh, phosphate buffered saline. So there are ways, and, and people are beginning to think about scavengers and perhaps different solvents and things like that. Okay, I'll move on to cryo now. So basically, what we're trying to do is have a snapshot of what's going on in the liquid by 
rapidly freezing it so we get not crystalline ice, but amorphous ice, which is electron transparent. And there's a number of ways we can do that. We can um, essentially, uh, you can blot to make the ice film thinner so we can see through it more easily and capture at a specific time point. Or we can spray onto the grid and, and, and plunge freeze it in liquid ethane. Uh, or there's a, another method, as I say, now you spray onto a cold grid and it freezes automatically. Um, and we're also beginning to do cryo tem lift out in the fib now. We have these little mechanical grippers that are cooled that can you cut away the lamella and lift it out cold. We've just started that. So basically, this is the setup. You have your grid on a pair of tweezers and it's plunged into liquid ethane, which is uh, freezes it more rapidly than liquid nitrogen. Or so that's a drop on the grid and then plunge. Or we can spray onto the grid and then plunge. Uh, and we can then get, say, particles in the liquid and, and look at, say, so these are bearing tight now, but it doesn't really matter. We can see that you've got some surface layer from the solution. Um, almost like coming out as a gel on the surface. And this is some sort of calcium phosphate from the solution. So we can do, within the ice, we can do chemical analysis as well as imaging. So um, liquid cell, we've got all these problems. Cryo is good because, because of the low temperature, all the damage rates and reaction rates of damaged products with the sample are lowered. Diffusion coefficients of these species, these radicals and things are also lowered in the, in the vitreous ice compared to being in the water in the liquid cell TEM. Um, uh, and, and so these damaged products should essentially be immobilized in the ice, basically. And this is just to show we can do imaging, we can do diffraction in the ice. We can do uh, uh, EDX maps in the ice. And we can even do eels in the ice. So we can get, an, this is a soup of different nanoparticles we used as a sort of test specimen, uh, which has got sort of zinc oxide, cerium oxide, iron oxide um, in. So we can do all the normal things. Here's another advert for scanning and STEM over TEM. So basically here at the uh, A and B, this is in TEM mode, so parallel illumination on the ice. And we get start to see damage in the ice at about 400 electrons per square angstrom. If we do it in STEM mode in dark field images here, you don't see damage in the ice till about three times that fluence. So it is it, stem, a cryo stem seems to be quite a, a nice way to, uh, to look at these snapshots of the, the liquid solid system. Okay, to, to finish up, well, uh, nearly finish up, I'm going to tell you something about um, crystallization processes. And, and this material, uh, it's, it's uh, um, essentially uh, plaster, calcium sulfate. Um, and it, basically you, um, it's known as gypsum, this material. And people wanted to know, okay, how's this thing crystallize out of solution? And traditionally, early literature said um, it, proceeds by what's known as a classical nucleation mechanism. You essentially form little crystalline nuclei of gypsum um, in the solution. And if they're big enough, they'll, they won't dissolve. They'll, they'll actually be stable. And they will grow into gypsum crystals, which are these long, um, uh, lo long crystals, basically. But more recently, there's been a, uh, some evidence, last 10 years, 
that maybe it goes by a non, what's called a non-classical nucleation route, which is a multi-stage process. You go through some intermediate and then it goes to gypsum. So people talked about, okay, actually it's forming a thing called bassanite, which is a, a hemihydrate. It's got half a molecule of uh, water compared to two molecules of water that gypsum has. And it forms little nano needles that line up and orient together in what's called a self-assembly or oriented attachment. And then these un undergo some sort of solid state transformation from bassanite into bigger gypsum particles. And a bit later on, they said, well, okay, maybe it's not bassanite, but maybe it's some little tiny three nanometer nuclei, which they didn't call bassanite that self-assemble and then eventually crystallize into gypsum. Um, okay, so we started off doing liquid cell on this, and this was many, many, many experiments. And then we also correlated this with um, cryo study. And what we found, and we repeated this lots of times, that in fact, uh, no, sorry, should take a step back. Instead of going from solution to gypsum, we decided let's make life easier. Let's start with bassanite, where we can see we've got something, uh, some needles. So these things, these little bassanite nano needles, and let's what? Let's hydrate those, and see about the transformation to gypsum, which are these big crystals here. And what we seem to find, in, in fact, the bassanite just dissolves into the solution, and then that saturated solution precipitates out as gypsum. And, and we achieved that through correlating a number of techniques together. It wasn't just uh, one, one technique. Um, sorry. Now, within these liquid cell experiments, you've got a number of things to think about, as well as the effect of the electron beam, which can change the pH, which might affect dissolution. Um, you've also got the effect of confinement as well. Um, things and, and confined spaces, things occur at different rates, much usually much more slowly. And then the other thing we wanted to do was use complementary techniques to confirm what we got in the liquid cell. So as I say, we started going from bassanite, this hemihydrate, and we hydrated it. Um, we essentially did it with water, but we've tried to slow it down by using a water ethanol mixture to go to gypsum. So we put some bassanite needles on our chip, clamp the top chip on top, so now we're in this situation. And then we flow through an undersaturated um, solution of calcium sulfate in there, so water, uh, with a bit of ethanol in. And these are the bassanite nanorods that we started with. And then we watched what happened. So this, so these are the original bassanite nanoneedles. This is the big gypsum crystals. Uh, at the end, and these are some videos, basically. So here are the bassanite nanoneedles, and you can see, in this case, they seem to dissolve and then re-precipitate as these big gypsum needles. This is just a sort of different view. It's like a gypsum plate, basically. And then there's another one here, just to, and we repeated this, sorry lots of time. And again, similar behavior, the bassanite seems to just dissolve and we get these big crystals of gypsum forming. However, right at the beginning, we did get this one experiment here where, if I just go back, you can see lots of needles and they seem to move around and then assemble into gypsum. So the first few experiments, we only saw this once or twice. The first few experiments, we it suggested we had this alignment 
oriented attachment mechanism which formed the gypsum. But if you look in other places, the, the passanite seems to dissolve. So the important thing about liquid cell TEM, I think, is to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat the experiments until you're absolutely sure. And what we then did is we did the same experiment. You can take the, on our, we've got a hummingbird chip. You can take that off the end and put, uh, take the chip in off the end with the still flowing the things in. And we put it into a Raman system. Uh, Raman microscope, and we can look through the window of the cell and do Raman spectroscopy. And basically, it's difficult to see here, but you've got um, bassanite gives a, a, a peak at wave number 1016, gypsum uh, 1008. And basically, you can, this is this region blown up. You can see it going from bassanite to gypsum and there's even a little peak here which is due to sulfate groups in solution so that backs up the idea it's dissolving into solution and then coming out as gypsum now this is good because in raman you haven't got the effect of the electron beam so you know that's not causing this but you still have confinement which slows everything down so this turned out to be the, the slowest process we saw in Raman. And what happens is the electron beam drops the pH and actually speeds up the dissolution. So it happens faster in the electron microscope. And then the final confirmation. Oh, and this and another thing we're just beginning. We're taking a holder down to diamond and looking in the hard x-ray beamline at diamond because in principle although i'm not so sure now actually after having talked to some people x-rays should be less ionizing than electrons but mind you the more i go into this you realize x-rays are quite ionizing as well um so quite it'd be interesting to see what the speed of the process is compared to electrons and we've got some initial studies but nothing convincing at the moment so we've had one go at this and essentially you can mount the the holder and the end of this beam line which is kind of neat um okay and then we moved to cryo tem to see if we could correlate the liquid cell with the the cryo and we did this spraying thing onto the grid um, and we did it two ways we had put bassanite nanorods onto the TM grid and then sprayed on the undersaturated solution to hydrate it. And we also mixed them um, on the weight of a spray nozzle and then sprayed the mixture of bassanite and the, the liquid directly onto the grid and then plunge uh, freeze into liquid ethane. There was no blotting of the specimen in, in this. So we did, this is the on-grid mixing. This is where we mixed them before we sprayed them. And here's all the, and these are different time points. These are the big gypsum. These are the little bassanite. And what we were looking for, it's a snapshot. So it's almost like looking at still frames in a movie. But what we were looking for is, is there any obvious alignment of these bassanite particles? And we did some image analysis with a plugin in image J, which looks for directionality in the image to see if, uh, if they were aligning and then going to gypsum, but there was no obvious alignment. So we, we conclude there is no oriented attachment, which would fit with the vast majority of the, the liquid cell measurements. So I think what came out of this is we really, highlight when you've got a difficult complex liquid solid system like this is use correlative approaches use um use sort of in situ uh use liquid cell but correlate it against cryo snapshots and correlate it against other techniques like raman and maybe x-ray as well so really the raman transformation of bassanite to gypsum by this dis dissolution precipitation, re-precipitation, 
no electron beam effects, but it's confined. And that was the slowest. Liquid cell TEM was faster because the electron beam was speeding up the dissolution process. And then cryo was actually the fastest. We saw the transformation occur fastest because there's no real confinement in the cryo, which is just taking a, a drop out of the solution. And there's no beam or well, very few beam effects. Um, so that occurred fastest. And that fits with the idea of um, the, the, the problems in liquid cell TEM. Okay, last few minutes. This is the caution retail. From the bassanite to gypsum, we went on to try and look at a solution, a satur super saturated solution. So now we're up at 50 millimolar calcium sulfate, whereby it should naturally come out of solution. Um, and look at, see if we can see gypsum crystallizing directly from solution. And we decided, okay, let's try five different methods. So the first one, very simple, it's what you start doing when you're doing TEM. You take a drop of your solution, just let it dry on the grid. Another way is to sort of rapidly dry it on the grid by vacuum filtering uh, the, lip, the drop through uh, and pull it with a vacuum through onto the grid. Another one that a lot of people do in, in crystallization literature, where you're crystallizing in water, you, you leave it crystallizing for a certain amount of time and then plunge the whole grid into ethanol to chemically quench the reaction. And then we also did cryo quenching, so plunge freezing. And there's two ways. We could either look at it in, a, in full cryo mode in the microscope with a cryo holder, or we, we, in the past, we've used this method of, it's almost like freeze drying. You take your frozen grid with vitreous ice, stick it in a vacuum, and it sublimes away the ice, basically. And you're left with your freeze-dried product, like a coffee or coffee powder or something. Okay, so we tried these. Okay, air drying. What did we see? We saw large gypsum particles, these great big things here. But we also saw shed loads of small batonite nanorods often aggregated with sodium chloride, which is a byproduct because we're using calcium chloride and sodium um, sulfate. So we get salt in, uh, dissolved in solution. Okay, so we actually see bassanite. So you might think, okay, bassanite's an intermediate for forming gypsum. If we vacuum filter, we see same results, but um, bigger aggregates of bassanite as well as some large gypsum particles. But what we think is happening is as you allow the thing to dry, even if it's dried very quickly, the supersaturation in the solution increases massively. And you can do some chemical modeling to show when you get above uh, a certain supersaturation, which is about 100 and between 100 and 150 millimolar solution, bassanite will come out of solution anyway. So we started with 50 millimolar um, calcium sulfate, where we'd only expect gypsum to come out and crystallize. But at, during the drying process, we're up, we, we concentrate the solution, and now bassanite. And this is a thing called saturation index. And when it goes positive, it means it comes out of solution. So drying can affect what you see, basically. Ethanol quenching, we get lots of bassanite as well. And, and bassanite seems to, ethanol seems to favor bassanite production, which has also been documented in the literature. You can actually stabilize bassanite in ethanol. So again, chemical quenching gives you a, a, a funny result. If we do cryo quenching and then sublime away the ice, so vacuum dry it, we get lots of uh, big gypsum particles, but um, essentially as you sublime the ice, the salt comes out of solution. So you see a lot of dissolved salts 
that would otherwise still be dissolved in the liquid. So that can be a, a, a big issue with this uh, freeze drying mechanism, but it's not showing bassanite, that's the point. There's no evidence of bassanite. Um, and, and again, as I say, ethanol uh, seems to promote bassanite formation. If we do full cryo, even after two hours, um, allowing it to crystallize for two hours, the only things we see are gypsum. We never see bassanite. And we believe the cryo is probably the, um, the most um, faithful way of telling you what's going on in the solution, basically. And we did exactly the same thing for calcium carbonate. Um, and the sort of general crystallization of calcium carbonate, the perceived wisdom is that you get an amorphous calcium carbonate forming first, and then it goes to calcite and vaterite, two different polymorphs. Um, you have another polymorph, aragonite, that can occur in, in weirder conditions, higher temperatures when magnesium is present and things like that. But people also talk about non-classical nucleation routes where you get a very dense liquid forming first and you get these pre very small clusters and then that goes to amorphous calcium carbonate. So I'll just show the same thing here, five different methods. What do we see? So air drying, we get lots of big round amorphous calcium carbonate crystals, but then you also get these little rhombohedra of calcite and these polyflower things of batterite. These are SEM images. Vacuum drying, similar. Ethanol quenching gives you big amorphous calcium carbonate particles, but also seems to dump out a load of tiny ones in solution, which we don't see in any other type of method. And chemical quenching has been used a lot. Plunge freeze vacuum dried now, so cryo and then allowing the ice to sublime. We only see ACC particles, and some of which are beginning to transform into what look like crystals. So these are all SEM. Images here. Um, and then just to go to the full cryo now, uh, what we see here at early times, so after five minutes, we see, sorry, I'll be finishing in a sec. Uh, we see, we see uh, amorphous calcium carbonate, but we also see, I don't know if you can see here, you've got this sort of dense region and that we think this is a dense liquid phase and we're trying to work out what the density of that liquid phase that's been captured in the ice is, which would be evidence for this uh, dense liquid. So I'll finish there. Um, conclusions really, um, take great care with sample preparation. You can get different results depending on how you do it. Do it a few different ways, see if they agree. And I guess the other thing is correlative cryo and liquid cell, we think is a good way to go. So I'll stop there before I get kicked out.